The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Talo for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spin-Off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spin-Off with help from Callaghan Innovation, New Zealand's innovation agency. Here's your host, Simon Pound. Business at its best can be a tool for bringing countries and peoples together, and things like fair trade and conscious consumerism hold part of the solution to helping traditional communities enter the global economy. One country that is really quite close and big, and populated but not widely known or visited or understood, is Papua New Guinea. More than 8 million people living mainly rural and farming lives, with some of the most amazing geographical and cultural diversity and oldest cultures in the world. However, colonialism, mining exploitation, civil war and international neglect have meant that PNG faces many challenges today, with the exploitation and unrest still forces to contend with. But perhaps the biggest issue is isolation, with such a small amount of travel, trade and understanding, meaning many unethical practices still continue. One of the coolest things about business is the way it can help lift and connect, and today's guests are working to do just that. Tamati and Rebecca Norman turned Family Connections into PNG Direct, a company connecting organic and naturally produced oils, spices and essential oils with international customers. Tamati is the former chair of the New Zealand Papua New Guinea Business Council, working to make more links. Traditional and respectful natural production is a big theme for the couple, who are behind Behind Native Rituals, a modern Aotearoa apothecary company making balms and fragrances that incorporate ingredients traditionally used in Māori preparations across time. To talk honouring the past, ancient knowledge and arming people for the future, Tamati and Rebecca join us now. Kia ora, thank you for coming along. Thank you for having us. Kia ora, thanks for having us. Hey, so first up, <clears throat> tell us a story about how it was you came to be interested in working with Papua New Guinea. <laughs> Well, it, um, it started with this beautiful lady walking down a corridor at church one Sunday afternoon and taking my breath away. <laughs> um, yeah, long story short, we after we got married, we um, 2009, uh, Rebecca's grandfather got sick. Um, I was working for the Ministry of Māori Development at the time, Tapuni Kōkiri, and we had to do a, a rush trip back to PNG. And we'd done uh, quite a bit of research around, you know, mm. What does the country produce? And hearing mum's stories. And when we went back, we had two weeks without cell phone reception on our island, which it now does, of course, which is as time develops. And you're sitting in the village and there's nutmeg falling on your head out of the trees. There's cocoa, there's coconut. And the island had been devastated by a large gold mine that had come in. And I was looking at Rebecca saying, I've spent the last eight years um, serving my community at home, working within my government role. Um there's got to be something that we can do here. You know, my, my in-laws had been sending thousands of dollars back every year to, to build things in the village, and that wasn't happening. So we were like, how do we... It's not teaching a man to fish, it's an enabling, enabling them to fish so that they can live the sustainable lives that they've lived for 40,000 years. Um, so it kind of... We, were, we went from Misama Island to Bwagaman, um, which is a equivalent of uh, Auckland to, I guess, Great, Great Barrier. Area. And um, it was on that trip that we were, that we went out to get pick up a pig, and they chopped up the pig, and we were 
we were coming back and it was an outgoing tide versus an incoming tide and we were surfing down this wave. We were meant to leave the island at four and we were coming back at six o'clock and two hours later and we're an outgoing versus an incoming tide and Beck is sitting between my legs wrapped up in polythene and trying to protect all our camera gear and <laughs> <laughs> everything that we took with us. All our all our wonderful digital equipment. And yeah, we, we found it. So the nearest land would have been about a kilometre away and it was a, when I say land, it's a small tropical um, coral reef and that's the, it was where the Solomon Sea meets the Coral Sea and we found it in boats and the, the tail of the boat is in the air, there's at the bow of the prow and all you can hear is the engine, din, 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 din. it's an old banana boat <laughs> and we're like, you know, we'd been searching for purpose I guess and I looked up and I said, okay God, if you if you let us get home safely, <laughs> I'll do what you want. <laughs> boat, boat boat comes down and away we go. Um, you know, when you're sitting with your tail in the air and water coming up around your knees, um, with your wife sitting beside you without life jackets, it kind of puts life in perspective. Um, with a about a hundred kilo pig chopped up in the nesky. <laughs> yeah, and my greatest fear is sharks. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, we bail. You know, to bail the um, the boat, we had a um, we had a pig's a pig's head in a pot. So they carefully take the pig's head out, and we bail the water <laughs> out of our banana boat <laughs> with the pot, and then we get out of this channel, and they're like, uh, "Do you want to catch tuna?" We're like, "No, no, no bro." Just get us home. <laughs> Our family, yeah. well, the fam- we were meant to be back the, f- the afternoon before, so no radio signal, no phone. Our family didn't know where we were. So I guess it was that kind of facing everything about your fears. Facing your own mortality and really challenging yourself with what your life's actually about. So for us, we took um, a few steps forward and... Um, really looked at how we could use our own skill sets or I suppose passion as well Um, and empathy which I think was a big part of our journey um, at the start and then looking at uh, this the sourcing of what they had on the island or um, establishing agriculture and for me it was really personal at the start as well um, because my grandfather had in the 60s and 70s established a lot of ag- agriculture on the island and he was well known for it um, so there was a real drive there to kind of take that um, as a bit of a nod you know um, and he was passing on uh, well he passed on about I think maybe a year year after our trip. So, yeah, it was, I think, for me, a really pivotal moment in our lives. And, yeah. Tell tell me about that connection to to, um, Papua New Guinea as well. And, you know, the way that the role it has in people's consciousness, Mm. uh, it has, you know, really challenging press. You only ever see, you know, the stories about... Um, you, you know the, the history of civil war, the exploitation by mining, mm. um, this background of colonialism and underinvestment that that's left it, and it kind of has this um, reputation as being dangerous and and the like. Like, how is it to have that actual connection to the place? Is it a fair kind of reckoning, or what? What, what, what is it when you know it deeper? I think that there's, an, I mean, it's, it's an inter- interesting place. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's an interesting place because there's uh, an incredible untouched beauty and there's also an incredible amount of, um, I suppose... Exploitation. Exploitation. So the country's on quite an incredible journey uh, because it, they're tr- it's trying to find its feet um, without the support of um, the Western world and well it does have the support of the western world but the western world is not looking at it from a value of people so Mm -hmm. when we when i look at papua new guinea for all like it's often described as a nation of oil and uh, oil and gold sitting in a sea of gas right and for me i look at the island at the islands and i say it's the people what is most important about the world? It is people. It is people. It is people. Papua New Guinea's greatest asset is its people. So this, this kind of like um, 
having the links to Papua New Guinea and seeing the way that it's kind of so little understood and we have so little to do with it as a country like yeah. considering it's it's so big and it's so close uh, and and there could be so many links I mean how do you actually go about setting up some of these relationships like um, you know and with your work with PNG Direct which is what mm. um, this kind of coalesced into uh t- t- tell me about how you kind of like i don't know build up the relationships between um coconut oil producers in papua new guinea and markets internationally i think that's years of uh networking tamati's greatest skill is networking he's yeah he's great at um developing relationships and authentic ones at which are really critical when you're working in a country like PNG. Um, they won't jump at every opportunity. Um, but the other thing too, which is a has been a great advantage for us, is me being from there uh, means that we yeah we have a little bit more of an easier journey in, in terms of connecting. What kind of products are you able to find in Papua New Guinea, and then how do you find them um, a market out there? So. For Papua New Guinea, if you put a stick in the ground, it'll grow. So, we, we, how we've, and going back to one of the earlier questions was, how how do you source and find products, right? So, our initial trip up, we were we were told, hey, this is this is some of the products that you have on the island. You have coffee, you have coconut oil. So I came back to New Zealand and I went out and said, these are the products that we've got. And I got Esquires on the line. I got Bell Tea and you know other other big companies that were, they just bought. They buy the story, and they bought the authenticity of what we were doing. The challenge that we had was the supply. You know, we, what we were told we could supply from PNG wasn't what was actually available. So I went, uh oh, what do I do? So we then turned from working directly with Misama, which is 200 miles off the mainland out towards Vanuatu, one of the more isolated islands in PNG, um, and working with other producers. So we went back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the PNG side, and said, hey, like, we've got opportunity and market here. How do, how do we do this? You know, like, we want to create market and grow market awareness. So for us, one of the ways that I see for us to change the perception of Papua New Guinea is through the palate. Papua New Guinea, as the fifth largest producer of coconut in the world, has one of the lowest export numbers. Um, and that's a lot to do with infrastructure. There's no roading. Um, the Port Moresby isn't connected to uh, lay. The, the Highlands Highway is like a goat track. You have different types of foods that you see, but they don't have the same. They may be able to grow it, but the scale of um, industrialization or commercialization of that mm. means that you don't have the same ability to supply into market. Um, and that's where we're really fortunate. We've got a really good um, partner in Papua New Guinea, Rona and Ray Con. Uh, or Rona Con, sorry, and Ray Chong. Uh, Ray Chong. <laughs> Ray Chong and Ray, Rona Con. Um, they're awesome because they are they are on the ground. They're ed- they're, they're Western educated, um, but they've got the same passion and heart for PNG as we do. But it, you know, for us, it's been like if we if they hadn't met, if we hadn't met Rona um, four years ago, that our business would be in a very different place. I would have had to be flying there every month mm. and just being on the ground. But having her there and Ray has meant that like I haven't had to go back for a little while because she's just you know she's sending us photos and videos of look here's us packing thirteen tons of coffee. Are these guys ready? You know, um, and that's been really really valuable of having the right people on the ground. And that infrastructure, has it just not really existed in the past for, yeah, so you've got this amazingly abundant series of islands and, you know, 80% of the population, so you've got, you know, um, there's eight odd million people there, so yeah, yeah I think, more than I seven think... million people are, are living rural lives and farming <laughs> and there's just no export numbers. Nah, and it's like, no, you look the at... the scale is, is not there. Um, yeah. there, there have been many attempts, um, including people like my mum and dad, who were missionaries on the island. My dad was a missionary, and that's when he met my mum um, on Dobu. But, yeah, so, so lots of people have uh, given it a good go um, as far as trying to establish, you know, small to medium businesses. Um, there, there, yeah. is, there are some really big and, businesses there. There, there are, you know, um, Agmark and, and companies that are doing really well, but their their focus has been more Asia, mm. you know, because they because of their positioning, yes. Papua New Guinea yeah. and all essence and all in effect should be the food bowl of the Pacific, 
they are so close to Asia, they're close to Australia, they're close to, you know, big, big nations and what they can grow. But I think a lot of it, uh, I, I liken it to economic sanctions because they stand as an independent nation. They, they're not governed by anybody else. Pardon me. And when you're not governed by anybody else, you've always got someone trying to control you. So when Australia left in 1978, or 1975, sorry, they didn't teach them how to govern. And then they made sure that they weren't trained to be governed by basically putting the most strictest border controls on them so that Papua New Guinea, even trying to go to the UN to do leadership training, were blocked from doing so, would have to fly through Singapore or, you know, go different routes because the Australians just wouldn't let them travel because if you can keep if you can keep someone subdued you can control them. So when they left they they left with the ability to control their gold, their gas, their oil and they they why govern a country if you can take their resources without having to less cost, less risk. Mm. Um, you know, so you'll often hear Papua New Guinean politicians they are, they 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 really hammer back against Australia. They there's just there, you know, those sanctions in place of there's no direct flights from New Zealand to Papua New Guinea. You have to go Auckland, Brisbane, Port Moresby, or Auckland, Cairns, Port Moresby, They're, and that's when you can get out to the rest of the islands. But in other, um, in other, so Samoa, Tonga, Raratonga, um, Tahiri, Vanuatu, there's all these direct flights. And if you, well, a way of limiting a country's economic growth is to ensure that it doesn't have direct links into market. We, we're exporting like something like 40,000 chickens a week to Papua New Guinea, and those chickens fly to, like, you know, baby chickens, and they get, they're, they're growing them in the highlands, yet they have to go Auckland, Brisbane, Port Moresby, Mount Hagen. Tell me about, like, um, the idea of starting native rituals. So you had a place to use a lot of these wonderful raw materials that you were starting to uh, develop markets for and export. So I am a trained makeup artist, and being in the beauty industry for many years was wonderful, um, freelancing and um, while while I've been teaching. Um, So that passion for beauty and coming from a performance background um, I suppose played a critical role in us engaging with James Iho Iho, who started Native Fragrances um, and again going back to utilising such incredible organic raw material um, other outside of that um, we didn't really have much so we thought actually this is quite powerful um, with me having thousands of years of, of history and in, in indigenous beauty practices um, picking up on that as well as Tamati being Māori and so yeah that that started the journey of of um, of our um, of our I suppose our values and our ethos um, yeah. so on our logo we've got the two Hoi Paddles, and yeah. So the, the hoi urangi are the um, traditional steering canoe paddles, and so <coughs> they for us, <coughs> pardon me, represent um, Rebecca and I as two people of Pacific origin steering our own destiny and and taking ourselves back into the Pacific as a meeting place. Um, so when James and I um, initially we met when I was at TBK, and then once I left in November 2011. Um, me and him kind of were, we kept in touch and I said hey bro want to use some of our vanilla and you know we were kind of talking about collaboration and then he had the fragrances work sitting there and we'd had some you know some of the challenges with getting you know the volume that we needed to have sustainable business and he said oh shall we work on the fragrances together and so we were doing that working away on the fragrances and um and one night I said, you know, Bex has always wanted to do her own cosmetics range. You know, like she's a music teacher by trade. Um, she's been a performer her whole life, but she's um, she really loves beauty. You know, that's that's something that's deep within her. And he goes, oh, we're already doing the fragrances together. Why don't we do the skincare? And I was like, okay. So we've got the raw ingredients. So uh, 2013, 2014, um, I basically took a step back from all of the business that we were working on, importing, exporting, and taught myself how to formulate. Cool. Um, mm, so I'd done a... It was a long, long a, process. I did a lot of... <laughs> we'd done a lot of research with oil. Um, we'd been working with coconut oil, 
um, you know, selling to manufacturers and supplying wholesale to people like Blue Coconut and others that were in the market. And I was like, okay, I can still do that. I yeah, can still... and a depth of research too, you know. Like so we you're... wanted to make sure that when we were presenting the, these products, um, it wasn't just about marketing. Um, was there was an authentic understanding there. So, so with that, we mm. learned a lot about other oils. So we learned about hemp seed oil. We learned about Moringa, which is one of our you know hero products. Is that, And we were like, where's our point of differentiation? What, are, what is different about our skincare range than everybody else's? Yes, it's we've got an unbroken connection to our ingredients, um, but we had to find something that was uniquely us, and that was where we were looking at Moringa and coconut. Um, and... Yeah, so going through that process of learning, um, I felt that I was strong enough to go out. And we were really fortunate that when we did launch Native Rituals in April 2015, um, we, had a, we were supported by a, a retailer. Um, we, I was ringing around people going, OK, who, who's influencers? Who's people that we can get to promote our, promote Native Rituals into the market? Um, using their, their, you know, their Facebook and social media databases, and ended up talking to Leanne Year from Collected, um, and she was like, hey, "Come in and see us." And I'm like, "What?" She goes, "Yeah, I got a shop. Would love to stock you." I was like, "Oh." So we went in and saw her. Within a week of being stocked there, we were in the we had a two page spread in Viva, <laughs> um, which they, which was pretty amazing. With um, oh, what was the lady's name from Viva? Janice. Janetta Mackay, and she did a mm. really amazing article on us that just very gracious for this. <laughs> yeah. I was I was talking too much as I do and spilling hot tea all over myself and it was yeah I'm I'm a clumsy person <laughs> I break things just by looking at them um, and then we had Marty Television and it was just when we first got asked to do the, the Viva article we were like ah oh, we're not ready and I was like are we ever going to be ready let's do it <laughs> tell our story um, Marty Television that was another one where. Uh, I said yes before thinking, <laughs> um, but it was good. Like it's been that that kind of people coming in behind us and believing in what we're doing has been really amazing. And I think probably one of our our weaknesses in ourselves is that we haven't talked about why enough in our business. When you go to our website, you might see it in our about section, but yeah, I've, one of the sayings that I really don't like within Tao Māori is "Tiriki te kumara." You know, for me, it's why the kumara. Why is the kumara not singing? Yeah, yeah. Because the kumara, when you go onto the marae, it's that beautiful purple, and you look at it, you're like, mmm, yum. I can just imagine that with butter and salt. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's talk about that sweetness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Let's oh, sing yeah. about that sweetness yeah. because it has to be something that changes. Because as Māori and as people of the Pacific, we have so much beauty within our culture, but we're so humble about it that nobody sees it or hears it. They only hear the negative stories. And, and that's what we want to change. We want to bring up... Yeah, sorry. I'll we want to celebrate. Yeah, and, and when you look back at our, the our mm. traditional... So have you seen the book um, Tupaya um, Cook's Polynesian Navigator? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually was um, about to ask you about the, the Mission Pacific idea. Um, yeah. With, with you know, the, the really cool way that with nat- Native Rituals, you're telling some of these stories of, uh, of travel and, the, and the, the navigation of the two cultures in the Pacific. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, the history has been so whitewashed that, you know, Cook's talked about it as a master navigator, but actually it was because he picked, up, picked no. up a fellow in Tahiti yeah. who happened to know, yeah, he happened to have a map and yeah. all of the of currents the of the entire yeah. Pacific, and he <laughs> spoke 20 languages. Yeah, yeah. In, a, in a time when apparently everyone was um, disconnected. Yeah. <laughs> And that, that was reading, when I read that, because I was feeling quite, I was just overwhelmed, I was exhausted, I was at the point. And I think, yeah, you get to a point where when you you are, I suppose we were at the foreground a little bit when it comes to, I mean, you've got, you know, brands like Pure Fiji, and but they're very, very much on scale and, and, and very much commercial, commercial. So for us, being these little... <laughs> Indigenous Fire brand. starters. <laughs> it was a little bit scary, so we we did get a little bit worried and second guessed ourselves. Um, okay. And then reading that book was a great affirmation for us. And it was at that time when we rebranded with the um, the hoy. The so that was quite a pivotal point for us. One of the mm. things that I, I and it's and it's often we don't think about it. So when you read the stories or hear the stories of first engagement, the stories are of how the indigenous people presented how they carried themselves is and you 
you know, jo- Joseph Banks was writing really in detail about the tapa cloth and how oiled their skin was and how fresh and vibrant they looked. And I'm like, hang on a second, there's something in this. We prided ourselves on appearance, mm. yet in within, I don't, yeah, within elements of culture that's been forgotten through colonization and oppression of identity. And I look at my grandfather, and my papa was a you know um, a league player. He was a he was from Te Hapua, born at Takapokora Bay, um, which is five five nautical miles further than Cape Ranga. Um, everybody goes to Cape Ranga and says it's the top. It's it's not. It's a little bit south. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I look at him, and I'm like, he presented, he carried himself. But he didn't pass on the the tikanga of you know because it was there was so much oppression within that, um, and I'm like man we need to bring that back, you know that that needs to be brought back so that there is pride in self so that our young people can look at you and be t- when they're talking look at you in the eye, valuing their identity and valuing themselves. This is new, where we look down. Uh, I've, I don't know quite where, how that happened. Well, I do know how it happened, but. You know, it's it's the, the evolution of colonization on the impact of it on people. But, um, yeah, I've been really, that encouraged me immensely, you know, looking back and, you know, every iwi and every hapu, they all have their own sense. They all have their own fragrance. They all have their own practices. But when the Tohonga Suppression Act came in, um, which I've been on Ngāta brought through, unfortunately, <laughs> um there was a whole lot of that loss of midi midi and um, you know Māori massage. So the, you know you've got Thai massage and all of these things, but there was actually a really strong culture and depth of care around the tinana, you know, and it, which around our body. And that was not it wasn't just our body; it was a holistic. It was body, mind, and soul. You know that the Tapa Far model that Sir Mason Jury. Um, Brought through, and so that is where we're going with native rituals now. Is we're moving to a place of Tifa Tapa Fa, which is the um, Ayo framework, and our Ayo framework is based around stillness and calm. And so I was listening to an uncle of mine, or my best mate's dad, um, Tawarahi Hitaraka, and when he was talking about the Battle of Rua Pika Pika, he said the the warriors they they were fit and strong, right? But they were in the days in the lead up to battle, they weren't doing pull ups and press ups. They were getting their mind in the right place. They were getting to that place of stillness and calm, so that when they went into battle, they were in that um, that that uh, I in like control. to call it them in control. They were in that mm-hmm. matrix space, you know, where mm-hmm. where they were in control of things. And when they ca- when they came back from battle, they would go back into the ngahere, and they would have this um, uh, uh, a deprogramming from battle to find that place of ayo, so they could become be, go back as the fisherman, go back as the hunter, go back as the farmer. You know, it's not once we're warriors, it's once we're farmers, once we're once we're fishermen. <laughs> it's that it's Sorry, that no. <laughs> it's that changing of, of mindset of we were cru- we we were we we were tiaki and tiaki is the we we were guardians because kaitiaki is actually um, guardians between the spiritual and the physical, whereas tiaki is a guardian of of space and and things and tiaki of culture. So that's kind of where, as we're moving with native rituals, that's where we're going to is that holistic point of helping people to start the day with calmness, with stillness, and to carry that through the day and then to be able to come down from their day at the end of it and have you know quality sleep. Mm. Sorry, I've gone way off no, subject. Not at all. No. Uh, not at all. And, and, and to be able to tell those stories and, and hero those uh, ingredients and preparations that have such a long history yeah. and, and tell those stories through these products and become part of people's rituals and part of yeah. people's day uh, is such a is such a cool way to kind of like become a vessel for those stories. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And we're, we're, where we've tried to go is that it's, it actually doesn't become about the product. It becomes about the person. You know, the products mm. are there as a part of that, but our focus is on helping to build you as an individual. You know, helping to, um, it's one thing to have a bath soak and order to use a magnesium bath or soak with koa koa with the um, bergamot and patchouli and, the, you know, the other essential oils. But if if you're just going to sit there and, and you're on your phone, there's no point. You know, you need to actually have a point where you're disconnecting and taking that time to breathe. Um, you know, I, I liken it to um, our tupuna used to write, sleep with the sun and rise with the sun. So if we start to shift back to that 
and now getting our sleep patterns to seven and to eight hours, there's a whole mindset clarity that comes with that and our productivity. Um, we were, we'll talk to it later, but when you know young entrepreneurs like us, we went into business and we were working 18 hour days, and completely and utterly inefficient. You know, if I worked yeah. a, if I worked a 12 <laughs> a 12 or 13 hour day, or a 10 hour day, um, and went to sleep, I would have been that much more productive, made less mistakes, and been clear and having a, a focus on our physical health. Our, um, you know, I think in business, we, so often I see business people that uh, their health is terrible. And when people are wanting to go into um, into the, into what we do and into business, it's really making your health a core priority um, because if your health isn't good, you're not going to be able to help anybody else. Mm. That's I think that's a really important message for us is just look after look after you, then you can help others. But you know, there, there's got to be a, an equilibrium balance there. Mm. I think. Absolutely. Well, yeah, and that, that is great advice to give to, to entrepreneurs or people starting out. Are there other lessons that have come out of the journey that um, that stand out for you? Get a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, uh, community uh, would be one big lesson. Um, and building as many or trying to connect as much as possible with other people who have similar interests um, is critical. Um, and... The other thing as well is just remember that it's a long game. You know, a lot of people go into business thinking that, you know, in three or four years we'll, 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 we'll make it, whatever that is. Um, but, and I think for us it's, we've been fortunate because there are some other very deep um, visions that we would like to uh, see um come to fruition in our lifetime they probably won't um but yeah it's just remembering that you know there are many more years to come in the life of this business and um pacing it yeah well, and then failure isn't failure it's learning if that makes sense but the learning can be really painful <laughs> and it's and it's how you pick yourself up you know there's been days where i've sat there on the deck with stri- tears streaming down my face going why am I doing this? Why? <laughs> and that's what I always that's what gets me out of bed is my why. Mm. Every morning I you know, I, every time you think about stopping, you're like, you know, like you said, Papua New Guinea is a pretty challenging place. Aotearoa is a challenging place if you're an indigenous person trying to tell an indigenous story. Um, it's your why. That that when you get knocked down and you're on your knees and you just don't know what to do, you're like, Okay, find my place of Ayo. Get that centeredness. Get back up and keep going. Mm. And that's, ah, that's awesome. Well, thank you for coming and uh, sharing your story today, Rebecca and Tamati Norman. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in finding out more, head along and check out PNG Direct and Native Rituals. Uh, thank you very much to Tina Tiller for producing, and thank you very much for having us along in your ears. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. Brought to you by The Spin-Off and Callahan Innovation. From The Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring. Brought to you by SparkLab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on SparkLab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.